Hey, what's up AP World? We have a video for you today on labor unions, everything you need to know about labor unions to succeed in a point. I just want to take a moment as we get closer to the exam, please make sure you are checking out all my other videos. There are lots of them and I'm adding them frequently and also check out apushreview.com for lots of good stuff. I just uploaded some flashcards there as well. Okay, let's start in the beginning with an important court case for labor un unions and this goes back to 1830 in the state of Massachusetts and the court case the the Massachusetts Supreme Court case, Commonwealth versus Hunt. And what this says was that labor unions are legal as long as they are not violent. And this was really more symbolic at the time than anything, but this is definitely the beginning of good times for labor unions. Let's get into a couple labor unions you need to know. The first one is the Knights of Labor, and it was led by this guy, Terrence Powderly, and his amazing mustache. Look at the whiskers on that. I have mustache envy in case you haven't figured this out by now. And one are the Knights of Labor. They're in the 1870s and 1880s, and at its peak, they had about 730,000 members, so quite a lot of people. The members included skilled and unskilled workers. This is very important to know which unions contain what type of workers, and this included skilled and unskilled workers. It also included lots of women and African Americans. Unfortunately for the Knights, they didn't last very long, and the reason why is there is this riot, the Haymarket Square Riot. There are a bunch of Knights of Labor members that are there, but somebody in the crowd who was an anarchist decided to throw a bomb and there was an explosion, and the Knights are, became unfairly associated with anarchists after that riot. So know that the Haymarket Square bombing led to the downfall of the Knights of Labor. Shortly after them, we have the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL, which is led by Samuel Gompers, or is it Colonel Sanders? I don't know. Come on, admit they look alike. And the AFL really began in 1886, and Samuel Gompers is going to be the president of the AFL until he dies in 1924, I believe it was. Now, the difference between the American Federation of Labor and the AFL and the Knights of Labor is that the AFL consisted of only skilled workers. I cannot stress this enough, guys. The AFL only consisted of skilled workers. And some issues that they focused on were what Gompers called bread and butter issues, and simple things like he wanted an eight-hour workday and higher wages and better working conditions. The AFL traditionally did not embrace strikes or violent tactics. They simply focused on bread and butter issues. And, and during World War I, the AFL will not strike. Another union that happens at the same time as the AFL is the IWW, or the Industrial Workers of the World. And they had two very famous leaders. One is Eugene Debs, who will become very popular in the 19-teens as a member of the Socialist Party, and also Mother Jones. And they were in the early 1900s, and the members just like the Knights of Labor, included skilled and unskilled workers. Now, their tactics were very different than other labor unions. They embraced strikes. They did not shy away from strikes. And they also embraced class conflict, or rich versus poor, the factory owners versus the workers. The IWW does not last very long. They have a downfall because, in most part, because of World War I. They went on strike during World War I. They went on strike so much that their nickname was I Won't Work, the IWW. I won't work. So they do not last very long. There's about four strikes you need to be, be familiar with. And the first one is the Great Railroad Strike, also known as the Great Upheaval of 1877. So you think to yourself, huh, what else happened in 1877? You know that is a compromise of 1877 when Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president. If you didn't know that, check out my video, Key Compromises in U.S. History. A bunch of railroad workers go on strike because their wages are cut. So President Hayes, newly President Hayes, sends in federal troops to end the strike. So he sides against the workers. This will be a theme. Presidents tend to side against workers. The Homestead Strike, 15 years later in 1892, this was at Andrew Carnegie Steel Plant, and workers clashed with security guards and then eventually uh, police as well. So again, this is the government siding against workers. The Pullman strike for the Pullman Palace cars happened in 1894, and again, this was a reaction to wage cuts, and President Cleveland used troops to end the strike, so he sent in troops to end the strike. He said it interfered with the mail system. Now, another strike is in 1902, and this time it's 
President Theodore Roosevelt. And this is the anthracite coal mine strike. Coal workers go on strike. The owner of the coal mine refuses to negotiate with the workers. So Teddy Roosevelt gets involved and he tells the owner, I will come in and I will seize the mines if you do not negotiate with the workers. So this is really the first time that the government does not side against the workers. The previous three, Great Railroad, Homestead, and Pullman, the government sides against the workers for the anthracite coal mine it does not happen very important to know this is a unique strike so when in doubt when there's a strike the government will side against the workers unless it's teddy roosevelt and the anthracite coal mine strike okay a couple acts that you absolutely positively must know and the the first one involving made labor that's very important is the sherman antitrust act this is in 1890. now the purpose of this you may wonder why what does this have to do with unions the whole purpose was to break up monopolies and trust you are correct however in actuality this is used to break up unions there's some really smart lawyers who were able to play around with the words and use this against unions that was not the purpose of this but it does end up getting used against unions 24 years later we have the clayton antitrust act which strengthens the sherman antitrust act and this time for union's sake the government gets a right and exempts labor unions from prosecution so no longer can labor unions be broken up under an antitrust act the Wagner Act of 1935, probably the most beneficial act in U.S. history for labor unions. This is under FDR. It is also known as the National Labor Relations Act, and it guaranteed workers the right to strike, and it increased union membership. This is a huge, huge boost for unions. You will see union membership increasing drastically. Unfortunately for unions, this only lasts about 12 years because in 1947, when Truman is president, we have the Taft-Hartley Act, which essentially reverses every single thing gained under the Wagner Act. It is very important to note that President Truman vetoed this, yet two-thirds of Congress overrode his veto. It outlawed the closed shop, which said that only union members could be hired. It also instituted an 80-day cooling off period if there's too much tensions between workers and owners and they would come back to negotiating afterwards. And this led to a decrease in union membership. So if you were to look at a graph of union membership, since 1947, it would steadily go down. The Wagner and Taft-Hartley, I can virtually guarantee you'll see it on your exam. They are very, very important for labor in U.S. history. Okay, some key terms to be familiar with is a strike is a refusal to work, and oftentimes when people go on strike, they pick it, and they protest carrying signs. Now, what do you do if you go on strike? You pick it. What do you do if your nose goes on strike? You pick it. Did you get it? I've been telling that joke for seven years and it never gets old to me. A boycott is a refusal to buy goods, and oftentimes you will see labor unions refuse to buy goods from the place of employment they work if things aren't going well. A scab is a name for a strike breaker, somebody who crosses the picket line and works when, when employees are on strike. And oftentimes these were immigrants. An injunction is a court order from the government and is often used to force workers to stop striking. Yellow dog contracts, here's a bad yellow dog, is an agreement that workers will not join a union and if they do, they can be fired. All right, that's pretty much everything you need to know about unions to succeed in A-Push. If you haven't already, take a moment, subscribe to my channel. Please spread the word. Let people in your class know. Let your teachers know. Post on Facebook. Post on Twitter. And um, I really appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day, guys.